grateful this morning again to be with you. And I, I know that maybe we've experienced some rain this weekend, uh, but if you're anything like me, then you're recognizing that it's officially that time of year where you have to go take a shower after you walk to and from your car in the public's parking lot. Like, it is incredibly hot outside. Uh, we're entering into, again, late July, early August, and uh, whether uh, it's, it's, it's to and from the car at the office or the grocery store, or maybe in a week or two to your kids dropping them off at school, we are officially at that time period where we all wish that the required dress code for the office was shorts and a t-shirt. And for those of us who work from home, um, we all envy you, and we maybe like you a little bit less during this season and this time of year. Uh, but there's uh, nothing probably better to do uh, when it is so hot out uh, than to find yourself sitting in a body of very cold water. And I know there's nobody in the room to give me an amen, but I hope on the couch I got a couple amens this morning. Uh, because again, if you're outside, you're sweating to death, but if you're in a laying in a body of water, maybe you can mitigate that just a little bit. And you could go to a lot of different places to do that. Maybe you've got a pool at the house or at a club that you belong to or a neighborhood pool. Maybe you go to the beach and, and then pop out in the ocean. But I think the best place to cool off during this time of year is about an hour and a half north of us. And it's a natural spring called Rainbow River. Now, maybe many of you have been to Rainbow River before. Maybe you haven't. Let me explain it if you have not. Uh, this is a natural spring up in like the Brooksville, Denellen area, and uh, the water stays consistently around 72 degrees year round. So, whether it's 95 out or whether it's 65 out, the, weather, uh, the water there, the temperature there stays right around 72 degrees the entire year, which means it makes it a delightful place to go and to cool off during this time. Of year, and, and if you've not been there before, you're maybe wondering, well, what do you do at Rainbow River? And I want you to lean in this morning. It's very important. Here's what you do at Rainbow River. <clears throat> Nothing. You don't do. You actually don't do anything. You rent an inner tube. You take a trolley three or four miles up the river. You get into that inner tube, and you sit and you do nothing. That's a beautiful thing, especially for those of us who are running 100 miles an hour and spend a lot of our time in the hot sun running 100 miles an hour. Now, a couple hours later, after you are laying in this inner tube doing nothing, the current takes you all the way down the river, and you arrive at your destination, you get out, and you head home. You didn't get to that destination by working really hard to swim there. You didn't get to that destination um, by willing your way to the bottom of the river. You just coasted there. In fact, if you uh, happen to uh, doze off while you were on Rainbow River and close your eyes uh, and you open them at the end when you found yourself at that destination, it would be very easy to look around to surroundings that you didn't uh, work your way towards or swim your way towards and ask this question, how, how did I get here? And I think that uh, for many of us, as we, as we look out into the world around us, I would venture to say that maybe some of us are asking that question about our world. How did we get here? How do we get here? How do we get to a world that denies the authority and lordship of Jesus? How do we get to a world that redefines what is good and what is evil? How do we get there? And I think we have to be careful not to ask that question too much about a lost world around us because the reality is we know how we got there. We got there because of sin. And people who do not know Jesus are not going to live as if they are in a relationship with Jesus. But here's what I would maybe push on us this morning for us to consider. Not only do I think we have the propensity to ask that question about the world around us, but if we were honest... I think that many of us can find ourselves, unfortunately, asking that very same question about the church. Like looking at the church in the West, in our country specifically, we could ask, how did we get here? How did we get to a place where churches minimize God's word, accept the values of culture, and forget our calling to minister to those in need? How do we get to a place where churches are the ones who are redefining the definition of marriage? Where churches are no longer advocating for the poor and those who are in need? 
where churches are just as divisive as the tribal political parties that surround us in culture. How did we as a church get here? To be clear, I, I'm, when I say we, I'm not talking about STF here because I, I don't think that is where we are. I think we are a church that elevates the scriptures as the authority of our life. And I think that we are a church that loves our city very well. But why are we that way? I think it's because there's a generation of folks from our church who have made sure that we would stay this way. That is to say, there's a generation of folks who have been a part of this church in the past, in a previous generation, that have made sure that the church today is following Jesus and living for him in everything we do. And last week, Pastor JJ actually talked about this as we we began this kind of two-week mini-series here at STF as we head into a new school year. We we thought it would be helpful to really share the kind of multi-generational church we strive to be and we actually believe that we are becoming and are. And and last week, Pastor JJ, he shared a message uh, with an older generation, if you will. His words, not my words, just to be clear, don't kill the messenger, shoot him. Um, But specifically with a generation of folks in our church, many of you, who have been here for a while. And J.J. shared how in a, uh, as an older generation, we have to recognize that we are not just called to share the gospel of Jesus with another generation, a new generation, a younger generation, but we are called to show the gospel to them as well. And as a caveat, just as someone who works very closely with Pastor J.J., When he talked about how an older generation needs to be a generation that passes the baton to another generation, empowers a new generation, equips a new generation, I can just tell you personally and many other people in our church can say, he is someone who practices what he preaches. And as we think about that reality, then we have to understand this. The church that we have today will only be the church we have today if those who are in the church today make sure that it stays that way, meaning... The health of our church, grounded in truth, preaching the gospel, making disciples, uh, advancing the kingdom of God around us, those things that we do today that don't cause us to look around and go, how did we get here, but instead cause us to go, we can move forward and advance God's kingdom in South Tampa and beyond, that will only remain if another generation picks up the baton. And as we look forward in time, let's fast forward 25 years. It's 2040 now. My generation, a younger generation, we are now older. We are now a generation that others are looking to. And here's the question I want us to ask today. Will another generation look at us then and say negatively, how do we get here? My prayer is that they wouldn't. My prayer is that my generation, those of you who are in your 20s and in your 30s, your 40s, you'd recognize the role that we play in carrying the baton forward to advance the kingdom of God through South Tampa Fellowship, being a church that continues to remain remain rooted and grounded in God's word. But I believe that there's an enemy coming for that. There is a trait that can become prevalent in our church, and that can actually, I think, begin to arise in a younger generation. And it's small, and it's subtle, but it's something that for every single one of us, we need to be aware of so as to make sure that we remain as a church who is grounded in Jesus and advancing the gospel here in South Tampa and beyond. What is that one thing we need to look out for? It's simple and subtle, but it's very dangerous. It's compromise. Compromise. What what is compromise? Here's a definition for you. Compromise is elevating cultural convenience over Christian conviction. Elevating cultural convenience, comfort in the culture, convenience in the world around us over Christian conviction, over the truth that is found in God's word. And so this morning, what I want to do is I actually want to walk through a story in Scripture from Daniel chapter 1. And this is a story where a younger generation is put in a position where they could have easily compromised, but they don't. 
And I think that in looking at this story and in examining what is happening here, we are actually going to be able to see not just steps that lead to compromise, but a way in which we as a, a younger generation, but I think also as a church as a whole, can be a people who do not compromise. So if you've got your Bibles, and I hope that you do, we'll have verses that will come up here on the screen with me. We're going to be in Daniel chapter 1. I want to start reading in verse 1, and this is going to give us some context for the story this morning. Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 says this. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. And these were carried off from the temple of the God of Babylon and put there in the treasure house of his God. So some things we need to understand going into this, this story. The story is set after the um, empire of Babylon's first attack on Jerusalem, which was happening uh, in 600 BC. You can actually read about that uh, occurrence in uh, 2 Kings chapter 24. And I, it's interesting that this nation attacks and defeats um, Israel. And verse 2 tells us that the Babylonians, they take things and vessels from the house of the Lord, from the temple of the Lord, back to Babylon. This is important because in this time period, uh, defeating one nation was not just our nation is better than your nation. It was also our God is better than your God. Kind of like our God beat up your God and, 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 and there was a showdown and, and your God lost and our God won. It's kind of like na na boo boo, like we beat you kind of thing. This is what's happening here. And, and, uh, and, and so they take uh, these things that were in the temple of God and they bring them back to Babylon. And, and uh, it's important for us to understand as we're thinking about this story uh, the, the, the nation of Babylon that we're going to read about today uh, is not merely just uh, an empire that existed thousands of years ago, which they are. This is this historical empire we're reading about in these moments. But if you read scripture, you actually begin to see something interesting about Babylon. And that's that it becomes an archetype or a symbol of nations that are trying to build their own kingdom outside of the authority of God. In fact, if you look at Genesis chapter 11, you'll see that the people come together and they want to build a tower to God, and this tower is called the Tower of Babel. We have obviously these moments here about the story of, of Babylon here in the, in the book of Daniel, and it, but if you fast forward even to the book of Revelation, there's multiple chapters in the book of Revelation dedicated to the nation of Babylon, and that's written in a time period where the Babylonian Empire doesn't even exist anymore. So what's going on there here? Well, that's being attributed in that time period not to Babylon the empire, but to Rome the empire. Why? Because just like Babylon, Rome was building a kingdom and a society outside of God's rule and reign. Meaning, we are reading a story that took place in a real historical society, but Babylon is a picture, a symbol, an archetype of any society that is outside of God's authority. That is to say, any society that says we want to build our kingdom outside of his rule. And I hate to break it to us, but our society falls into that category. So what we see Babylon do here is actually very similar to the strategies and the things that we see happen in our culture, especially when it comes to the temptation and the pressure to compromise. Let's keep reading in verse 3. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of the, his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. And young men that were without any physical uh, defect, they were handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. And the king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. And among those who were chosen were some of, uh, from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And the chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And to Azariah, Abednego. So this is where we're going to be introduced to Daniel. And it's interesting what we see in this text. Because we actually see a calculated effort by Babylon to get these boys to compromise on their way of life. And their way of life had been a way of life that had been grounded in the authority of God as their ruler and Lord. 
And again, I think this is important for us, especially in the topic that we're discussing, because these are young men who are now being raised and growing up and living in a society that their parents would not recognize, a society that their grandparents and a generation before them never experienced. Sounds pretty similar to us today. Because if you're in your 20s or your 30s, you're growing up in a world your parents didn't grow up in. You're raising kids in a culture that your parents didn't raise their kids in. But I think what we're going to see here is that despite the differences, there is actually some similarities, threads that go throughout any time in history. So what I want to do in this next section is just take a couple minutes and explain, based upon these verses we just read, what Babylon is doing to these boys to get them to compromise. Because I think that what Babylon is doing to these young men is the same thing that Babylon, that is to say, sinful societies in every time point in history do to try to get those who follow closely after God to compromise. Three things I want you to see this morning. Here's the first thing that Babylon wants to do. Babylon wants to isolate you. That is to say, Babylon wants to separate you from godly community. Verses 3 and 4 tell us that these young boys are actually taken from Israel, from Jerusalem, their way of life, to Babylon. Now, Jerusalem is is a city that is built around the authority of God. The temple, right, is a focal point of worship and and, and, and spiritual and community life. Everything is built around God as the ruler and king of Israel. And then you're taken away from that, and you're exposed to a new land with new languages and different gods and different priorities and and different cultural values. Why? Because the Babylonian Empire, like, like when we think about this from like a political standpoint, they wanted to take advantage of the best of the best in the nations they took over. Well, how do you take advantage of them? Well, you have to get them to be people who can contribute to your society. How do you get them to do that? Well, they have to be people who think like you, talk like you, and believe like you. And that's what they're getting them to do. We can't make them do that in Jerusalem. We have to separate them and get them to do that here. Meaning, you want to know how the enemy wants to compromise you and make you compromise? You want to know how the enemy is working through the Babylons of our day? First, he's just trying to separate you from godly people around you that would push you towards Jesus. It is always easier to make a decision when there is not a voice in the other ear calling something different out of you. And I just believe that when it comes to compromise, the enemy wants to find ways to separate us, which is, by the way, why I think that oftentimes when tough things happen in our lives, we find ourselves maybe willingly or unwillingly, but naturally beginning to cocoon and to isolate ourselves. To to remove ourselves from other people around us. We do that when we make a decision of failure. We do that when maybe the bottom falls out. Like we think maybe I just need to like, 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 you know, gather the wagons and, and, and be by myself. In fact, isn't it interesting that oftentimes in our context, When life gets crazy, what is the first thing that we remove from the calendar? Church. Time with the people of God. Let's not be naive and not think that there is a greater spiritual threat at work that's causing us to do that. Because if the enemy can separate you from godly community, who can encourage you, who can challenge you, who can push you towards Jesus, then the enemy can get you to think that compromise is normal. Why? Because you're not seeing anybody live different than that. Babylon wants to separate you. Here's the second thing Babylon wants to do, though. Babylon wants to integrate you. That is to say, Babylon wants to twist your God-given desires. These boys, look at verses 4 and 5 one more time. What was this uh, uh, chief official supposed to do for them? He was to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians. And it says that the king assigned to them daily amounts of food and wine from the king's table, and they were to be trained for three years, and then after that, they were going to enter his service. So, these boys are given two different things that are important to note here. And, and, and again, like what's happening here? Babylon's trying to integrate them into their society by twisting their God-given desires. They're going to be taught uh, the language and literature of the Babylonian Empire, meaning like this is the greatest empire in the world at this time. So the, 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 the greatest um, uh, wealth of knowledge is found in Babylon from architecture 
to astrology, to mathematics, to philosophy, all that is housed in Babylon. It doesn't mean that everything they were learning was false about the world, but it does mean that everything they were learning was under the umbrella of a worldview that did not say that Yahweh, God, was king. Meaning they were learning good things, but they were learning them often with an ungodly foundation. I mean, but that kind of appeals to you. I want to be smart. I want to be intellectual. I want to have the answers for the test, so to speak. And that's how Babylon begins to integrate you. Hey, let me give you something that you long for, but let me give it to you my way. A godly desire met in an ungodly way leads to godlessness. But they're also given food from the king's table. That doesn't seem maybe too big of a deal, but it was for two reasons. One, this food was not kosher, which means it did not follow the dietary laws of the Jewish people. And, and why was that important? Well, in this time period in redemptive history, maintaining a certain diet was also paramount to maintaining righteousness before God. God's people were called to be holy and set apart, and one of the ways they did that was by how they ate food. But there's a deeper level of uh, uh, something going on here as well. This is not just saying they were given food that was not kosher. It says that they were given food that came from the king's table. And scholars tell us that anything that came from the king's table, food, was also accompanied with concubines that came with it. Meaning these boys were not just being given pleasure and food, but they were also being given and, and offered sexual pleasure as well. Both of which were outside God's design for them, but both of which played upon innate godly desires that were put within them. Meaning... Babylon is trying to meet a godly desire in an ungodly way. And if it can do that, it will begin to integrate you into their society because you will begin to find fake satisfaction in a world that cannot offer you and give you ultimate satisfaction. And we have to understand that this is still at work today. In fact, sociologists, they talk about uh, when it comes to influence, this concept of hard power and soft power. Hard power is, think about it like power and influence by force. Think about like military power or police and whatnot, which means it's not necessarily bad, right? If you break this law, you will go to jail. Like that is hard power and that is a good thing. But sociologists say that soft power is actually, because it is so subversive and so subtle, it's actually more dangerous and more effective in influencing someone because it is harder to spot and point out. Hard power is like there's a stop sign. Stop. I can see that. I can avoid it. I can say, I'm not stopping, and I'm not going to be influenced by that. But that's not soft power. Soft power is your car slowly being drained of its fuel. So that it has to stop. Soft power is, I don't need to spend time with God every day. Soft power is, well, everyone talks like this at my office. Soft power is, well, I'm not, I'm not gossiping. I'm just telling the truth about who that person really is. Soft power is, it's going to be awkward if I talk to my neighbors about Jesus. Soft power is, no, we don't talk like that in our home, but, but we allow shows and movies and TV shows that do talk like that in our home. That, that's soft power. It's subtle. It's subversive. But it's lethal because it slowly lulls us to sleep. And it puts us in a place to where we become people who compromise more easily, not because we woke up and said, today I'm going to compromise, but because we have slowly been integrated into a culture and a society that is against God. Hard power, again, is a wave picking you up at the top of Rainbow River and rushing you down to the end. Soft power is the small current that slowly pushes you miles down the river without you even recognizing that you've moved. And that's what makes it so dangerous. And I, I could just be direct to just my generation. I think that this is one of the things that we have to be very aware of, because I think for many of us, we can walk in well-intentioned means at times, and in fact, even look at a previous generation critically and say, well, I don't think the way that they did church, they preached the gospel, they made disciples, I don't think it was really effective, I think it hurt people, I think it was judgmental or whatever. Oftentimes, we do that 
well-intended, but it's actually based in arrogance. It's based in us saying we know how to do things better than a previous generation has. No, it's not to say that there's not wisdom in another generation reaching the next generation. But we have to recognize that in trying to reach people for Jesus, we can so often at times actually minimize the Jesus that we're trying to reach people with. And in our generation, in fact, here's where I see this taking place. I see us finding moments where we are attempting to maximize Jesus by minimizing the words that he spoke. In fact, I love how Beth Moore, who's an author and a speaker, she was speaking at Passion Conference a few years ago, a conference for like 20-somethings, like a younger generation. This is what she said. I think it was prophetic. She said, you'll watch a generation of Christians, yes, of Christians, set aside the Bible in an attempt to become more like Jesus and stunningly, it will sound completely plausible. And this will be perhaps the cleverest of all the devil's schemes in your generation, in our generation. We can sacrifice truth for love's sake, and then you will rise or fall based upon whether you will sacrifice one for the other. He, she says this, will you have the courage to live in the tension of truth and love? Meaning, when Babylon wants to integrate you into society, when Babylon wants to integrate you into the culture at large, one of the things that the enemy is going to do to lull you to sleep is get you to believe that your God-given desire for other people to know and experience the love of Jesus can be met by you minimizing the truth of Jesus. And I'm just going to tell you right now, that's a lie from hell. And if we're going to be a generation, this generation, my generation, if we're going to be a generation that continues to lead this church and launch this church to build the kingdom of God here in South Tampa and beyond, we have to be a church that holds tightly to the truth of God's word, regardless of the waves of culture around us, regardless of what we're told about how toxic our beliefs are or how unhealthy our beliefs are about this subject or that subject. Do we actually trust that Jesus is who he says he is? Do we actually trust that he is good? Because Babylon wants you to believe he's not. And to get you to believe that, they're going to try to integrate you by giving you ways to meet godly desires in an ungodly way. But here's the last thing that Babylon wants to do to get us to compromise. Babylon wants to identify you, meaning Babylon wants to tell you who you are. Notice that when these boys get here, the first thing that happens is that their names change. And that might not mean much to us, like a name is just something that we're called. But in this time period, your name was more than just what you were called. Your name was actually based on your identity, meaning your name didn't just say, this is what I'm called. Your name said, this is who I am. Let me actually give you the meanings of the names of these four young men. Daniel, his name means Yahweh is my judge. Yahweh, the name of God given to Moses in Exodus chapter 3, is my judge. Hananiah, is name, his name means Yahweh is merciful. Mishael, his name means the one who is like Yahweh. Azariah, his name means the one that Yahweh has helped, meaning that everything about these boys when they arrive in Babylon associates them with the God of the universe. So what does Babylon want to do? We want to disassociate you with that. Because if we can tell you who you are, maybe eventually you'll begin living like that. So what are their names changed to? Daniel's name is changed to Belshazzar, meaning Bel, who is the king of the Babylonian pantheon of false gods. Bel's prince. Hananiah's name is changed to Shadrach, meaning under the command of the moon god of Babylon, Aku. Mishael, his name is changed to Meshach, meaning the one who is great like Aku. And Azariah, his name is changed to Abednego, meaning servant of the Babylonian god of wisdom, Nebu. Why do I tell you this? I tell you this because I want you to understand that Babylon, if they can identify you according to their standards, according to their values, then we, I mean, we, under, we talk about this all the time. Your activity flows from your identity. So if I can tell you who you are, then I can control and get you to do what I want you to do. Which, by the way, is the reason why 
that the message of the gospel is a declarative message about your identity that changes in Christ. When you come to Jesus, what happens? It says in the book of Romans, you are declared righteous. You are not righteous yet. And you and I can say a big amen to that because we know that. We look at our lives. There is unrighteousness still here. But what does God say about you? He says you're righteous. He says you're blameless. He says you're a child of his. Those are all identifying statements. What does our world say about you? Our world says, no, you are your sexuality. You are your career. You are the money you make. You are how successful your kids are. You are what clubs or what things you belong to. You are the influence you have. Our world does a really good job at identifying us. And no, we're not named after false gods in a Babylonian pantheon, but we are named after gods, ladies and gentlemen. They're the gods that our culture puts on the throne. The God of sex and pleasure. The God of wealth and success. The God of influence and cultural relevance. We rename one another according to that. I'm just going to tell you right now. Compromise seems normal when you listen to the identity you've been given by a culture against God. None of us wake up in the morning and say, today I'm compromising. But all of us wake up in the morning being told who we are. You are not defined by who you date, how much money you make, how many followers you have on social media, what scholarships you've received, what school your kids go to, how many businesses you've sold, your position at the office. You're not defined by the trauma you experienced in the past. You're not defined by a sin that plagues you in the current. You are defined by the one who hung naked for you on a cross and said with his last breath, it is finished, meaning your striving for meaning, your striving for worth because of your sin is done because it's been taken care of on the cross. And the one who came out of that grave declares over you that if you are in Christ, in him, you are righteous and you are a child of God. That is the identity that you hold on to. And that is the identity that produces activity for the king of the universe, God himself. But if we cling to identities that we're given, that are changed on us, and they go to and fro with the different crashings of the winds and the waves. We are going to be a people who are always looking to whoever is naming us as our authority. And when you look to those around you to name you and be your authority, you find yourself being restless because you go, who do I have to please today? Whose affirmation do I have to get today? If Babylon isolates you, integrates you and identifies you, Babylon can get you to compromise. But just in these last couple of minutes we have together, I, I do want to give you, though, the hope on the backside of this story. And that hope is found in the strategy that we see these boys implement to not compromise. And I think it's something that we can implement for ourselves. Let's read the rest of our passage in Daniel uh, chapter 1. Let's read in verse 8. We'll keep going. But Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. So he asked permission from the chief official not to defile himself. And God granted Daniel favor and compassion from the chief official. Yet he said to Daniel, my lord, the king, he assigned your food and drink. I'm afraid what's going to happen to me if he sees your faces looking thinner than those who are around you, the young men of your age. You would endanger my life with the king. So Daniel said to the guard, whom the chief official had assigned to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, well, please, test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat, water to drink, then examine our appearance and the appearance of the young men who are eating the king's food, and deal with your servants based upon what you see. So he agreed with them and tested them for about 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked better and healthier than all the young men who were eating the king's food. So the guard continued to remove their food and the wine they were given to drink, and he gave them only vegetables. So Daniel makes a decision and says, listen, we're not going to do this. We're not eating this food. We're not compromising on who we are and who God has called us to be. So he tells this official, hey, listen, I realize, like, like, I realize you're willing to help us out here, but it's going to put you in a tough spot because if we're around here looking all skinny and famished, the king's going to go, what did you do? Why did you not give them this food? So on and so forth. So he says, hey, just give us a test. Ten days, we'll do our own diet. And if you come back and we look uh, skin, skinnier and thinner than everyone else, we'll go back on the king's food. Well, that doesn't happen. 
It, it literally says they looked better and healthier than all the other young men. In fact, in Hebrew, it literally, the phrase there literally means they were fattier than all the rest. And just as a side note, I'm sorry for those of us who practice the Daniel fast to lose weight. If you're trying to be biblical, you're going to put weight on, just saying. But anyways, um, you have to understand, though, that in this text, we actually see this, these verses. We see a, an outline given to us on how we can avoid compromise because Daniel doesn't compromise. And here's what we see in him. Here, here's the, the kind of landing the plane, big idea we have to understand for this morning on how we avoid compromise. We will avoid compromise by a conscious decision in our mind based on a compelling motivation in our heart. A conscious decision in our mind, okay? Look back at verse eight. It says, Daniel determined, like he made the decision before the food was in front of him. I am not going to compromise. I am not going to do this. And I think that's important for us to understand because we can't just sit in a room or in our living room right now and say, okay, oh, well, I'm not gonna compromise. Okay, but how are you not gonna compromise? What are you determining, right? If we think about this, again, just a logical sense, one of the biggest crazes right now in productivity and office culture is the, the art of predetermination, right? Like predetermining as many things as you can in your life so you free your brain up to make decisions that come out of left field, right? So predetermining like what you're going to wear the next day, predetermining what you're going to eat for breakfast or whether you're going to buy coffee or make coffee or predetermining what meetings you're going to have throughout the week, right? Again, we recognize in a business sense, like that's a good strategy. That's healthy. That's efficient. But in a spiritual sense, predetermined, I'm going to read my Bible every day. Predetermined, I'm going to set an alarm of when I'm going to read my Bible every day. Predetermined, at this time every day, I'm going to open the prayer app. I'm going to pray for those who are around me, who are in godly community, who are in relationship with me here at STF. You have to recognize and understand that the only way you will avoid compromise is by predetermining, making a conscious decision not to compromise. And I love that even it goes on here because it doesn't just say, well, he determined, but he actually gives himself a plan. He says this to the servant, please test your servants for 10 days. And he says this, let us be given vegetables. So it's not just like, all right, well, we're not going to eat the food. He goes, dude, don't even put it in front of me. Don't, don't even give me the temptation in front of my eyes. Like, let me be given something different. Like, don't even give me the opportunity to look at those websites on my phone. I'm going to put filters on my phone. I'm going to have accountability that sees my internet history. Don't even give me the opportunity to gossip and say bad things about people because when that starts happening, I'm predetermining, I'm leaving the conversation. Don't, don't even let me be given the temptation to think that like throwing in the towel is the answer for my marriage. Because we're going to say consistently to each other, divorce is not an option for us. Divorce is not an option for us. We are predetermining and giving ourselves a clear intention and in saying, I'm not going to compromise because I'm going to do this. It's not just removing, it's replacing. Removal is good, but removal still leaves a gap. We have to replace that gap with the one who's meant to be filling every gap in our life, and that's Jesus. Which leads us to that second part. Because it's not just a clear decision it's a compelling motivation as well. Because decisions are good. Predetermining is good. Knowing, okay, this is when I'm going to read my Bible. This is when I'm going to pray. This is when I'm going to go and spend time with godly community and a community group or whatever it might be. That's all good. But if it's only motivated by you and your own strength, it will not be good enough. What was Daniel's motivation? It's the same motivation we should have. Verse 8, one more time, and then we'll close. He did this all so that he would not defile himself. That word defile here is not like a, just a cleanliness word. It's actually a spiritual cleanliness word. Again, in this context in redemptive history, what you put into your body and what you did with your body made you righteous or unrighteous before God. And by the way, like, that has not changed. What we do with our bodies makes us righteous or unrighteous before God. But just like Daniel, who needed a sacrifice, something that was clean without blemish to take the punishment of his sin, we need the same thing. But it's not a goat. It's not a lamb. It's not an animal. It's Christ himself who's been sacrificed for us. He gave his life so that the wages of sin, which is death for us, would not be death for us, but instead would be life, his resurrection life within us. So why would we say that our motivation can be the same as Daniel's? Because at the end of the day, his motivation was he wanted nothing to come between him and his relationship with God. And that's a compelling motivation. 
The beauty of the gospel is that God has forgotten your sin as far as the east is from the west. He never leaves you and never forsakes you, but you know who can leave him? You and me. And we can let things step into our life that distract us from Jesus. We can let things move into our life that take our eyes off of Christ. But we have to understand if we're going to be a people in a church who do not compromise, we have to be a people who recognize that our relationship with Jesus is the primary focal point and focus of our entire life. He is the one who satisfies, not the way that Babylon is trying to satisfy you. He is the one that gives you purpose, not the means and the methods that Babylon gives you to provide purpose. He is the one that gives you life and identity, not Babylon who tells you that life is lived for the affirmation of others. Your identity is something that we give you because you earn it. The motivation for not being a people who compromise is a people who recognize that God really is good. And he really does have our deepest joy in mind. And he has a design for you and me. And that design at times causes us to say no to the things that we want in this world. But we realize and recognize that in throwing off in saying no to the desires that we are enslaved to, we become enslaved to a greater master, and that is Christ himself. And he is a Lord who loves us and cares for us. And he is a God who knows what is best for us. If our relationship with Jesus is our motivation, not because we're afraid of God being mad at us, not because we're afraid of God judging us. God's judgment on us has been poured out on Christ on the cross. No, our motivation is the love of God that is running so hard towards us. He is the one that leaves the 99 for you. He is the father who runs after the younger son who has squandered all of the father's blessing. That's the heart that should motivate our heart to make a clear decision not to compromise and to stand firm in a world that wants us to do just that. And I know, as I said a minute ago, that I think at times my generation often we can look at an older generation and we, and we can say, you know, well, you don't get it. You don't understand how hard it is to raise my kids now. You don't understand how hard it is to live in this culture and context here. But as we sang a minute ago, that song... I would recognize you that, and say to you that, yeah, like 20s and 30-somethings, like we, we're, we're living in a different world than our parents. We're raising kids in a different context than they raised us in. But you know what we do have? We have the same God. The same God that can step in in the midst of our anxiety, stepped in in the midst of our parents' and grandparents' anxiety. The same God that provides for us in our time of need is the same God who provided for our parents and grandparents in their time of need. And the same God that can step in and help us with the current cultural pressures of our day is the same God that stepped in and helped our parents and grandparents and the cultural pressures of their day. We live in different times. We exist sometimes in different seasons, but we all worship and praise the same God. And that's how we can remain united as a church. And that's how we can make sure that our church today and 25 and 50 and 100 years in the future is a church that is always passing the baton to the next generation. And the baton they're passing is a church that is grounded on God's word, preaching the gospel to a lost world and making disciples in South Tampa and beyond. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you for this morning that we've had a chance to gather together. It's been unique. It's been different. But Lord, we know your presence has met us here. And so God, we just thank you for this time we had today. Thank you for your word. And I just do ask that you help us to be a people who do not compromise. Help us to be a people who love the world around us well, but don't minimize the truth that you have given us. And help us to be a church that is continually growing and being shaped by the truth of your word. We love you, Jesus. We praise in your name. Amen.